Uh, thanks for all being here. I, this session is called the Rare Cancer Conundrum, and we were just talking a minute ago about what that meant. And I'm going to pause it for a moment that when you look at, I'm going to be blunt, the cancer industrial complex, it, it's directed at a lot of things. I know, Len, Dr. Len, you've talked about every, every cancer is a rare cancer, but there are a lot of those every cancer is a rare cancer that get a lot more focus than others and a lot more support than others. There's a mainstreaming and a non-mainstream. And I, and I guess I want to start with, with Kim. If you're in, a, in a, um, an arena with a rare cancer, what does your world start with? And, and, and what, how, do you, what, how, how does that track look like, perhaps compared to other cancers that are in the, in the system? Well, I think that, uh, you know, when we look at the challenges the cancer patients face in general, we look at the rare cancer community, you can multiply that by 10 or by 20. The challenges are so much greater. One of the early problems that we see in these rare cancers is misdiagnosis. Um, so then oftentimes mistreatment, right? We have difficulty identifying sometimes uh, and diagnosing these cancers. So they're identified potentially as something else or doing, treating symptoms. So we're not getting patients as quickly as possible to the experts they were just referring to in the previous panel. To is that getting better? I mean, I, I've, I've heard that misdiagnosis is a problem in health in general. Uh, and a lot of the companies out there, Siemens and no. Hitachi and all, are, have diagnostic machines and automation that are trying to... It, 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 is there a path forward that you sense improvement? Well, the, t the challenge is that uh, we, we think about the big academic mm -hmm. cancer centers a lot of times when we think about cancer, the Memorial Sloan Ketterings, the MD Anderson right. School. But the reality is, and most people don't know this or even recognize it, is that 80% of people with cancer are treated in a community setting. They're not treated in one of those big academic centers where they may have some of the more precision testing, some of the more precision diagnostic tools, uh, where they may have the clinical trials uh, that are available. So recognizing that the majority of patients are treated in these community settings, I think that, that w I think we're certainly making some progress in terms of, uh, in terms of biomarker testing and being able to be more precise in diagnosing some of these cancers. But the, the, the truth is they have to get oftentimes from a community setting into an academic setting to even get with the right folks to use the right tools to diagnose the cancer and then go ahead with the treatment plan. Dr. Len? I, I think that we have to remember, I'm going to take a, a lead from what Kim just said. When you talk about cancer care in this country, a substantial amount of it, the majority of it, far and away, is given in community settings. And I will tell you what has struck me here today, as it strikes me frequently, and I talk to people around the country in a variety of settings, and I live in a small town in rural Georgia. I mean, so I'm familiar with the issue. What struck me today is you're listening to activated patients. Hmm. It is very simple to sit and say, I don't mean to, when I say simple to say, I don't mean it negatively, but the reality is it's easy to say, and I say in appropriate times, we would all say, that people need to get to the level of expertise that's required. And in fact, in fact that, that level of, of expertise required is moving, as I would say, further down the chain. Years ago, what was fairly, fairly standard treatment across the country for lymphoma, for example, is now highly specialized in diagnosis and treatment to the point that I have personally think that lymphoma should be diagnosed as a center that is very familiar with lymphoma before a treatment course is, is stated. But a lot of cancer, a lot of patients are not activated. A lot of patients do not have the resources to make that trip. A lot of people don't want to make that trip. Mm -hmm. So the net result is, and the, and the question and the quandary we face, is how do we make sure that every person in this country with every form of cancer including the uncommon, more uncommon forms, every form of cancer gets the right treatment. And we are not there yet. We have a long way to go to meet that, uh, to meet that challenge. Do you think the challenge is a marketing challenge? You know, sometimes when you see that people are not informed, not getting this, that there's, you know, sometimes when I look at how uh, excellent we are at selling cereal mm -hmm. to uh, kids or getting kids to get their parents. So, I mean, there's so much manipulation and social engineering in the system. I just wonder why we don't have more social engineering in the things we need. 
Um, so is, is there a gap there? I mean, I don't mean to be facetious about it, but is marketing part of the problem? Well, I don't think people, people don't want to talk about cancer until they have cancer, right? right? So, right. you know, the, you know the, 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 the analogy I don't think holds up because we're, you know, we're exposed to these other sort of consumer products on a regular basis. But, I mean, it's the same. I, you know, I used to work in organ donation and organ transplant. Nobody wants to, nobody wants to no healthy, happy family wants to sit down and talk about what's going to happen if you're in a car crash, right? Mm. So nobody wants to talk about cancer until they're actually confronted with a cancer diagnosis. And then you move into this very small stream and very small channel of opportunity. But I, it, it, it's important, aside from the diagnosis piece and getting to the right treatment, again, when you talk about rare cancers, you're talking about very specialized care, very specialized treatment. So you oftentimes are talking about traveling. Mm. You're talking about transportation costs, housing costs. You're talking about leaving your job. You're talking about leaving your family. And as Len said, maybe some people just d don't even want it. Just whatever it is, I'm going to deal with it here in my community with my community doctors. I don't want to travel those distances. So aside from the, 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 the sort of medical questions right. in terms of diagnosing and treatment, you have a lot of very practical barriers that patients face to even get to that care if it's available to them. Richard, you've talked a lot about the cost of the rare cancer corner and the rare cancer patient that the that the the choices they have sometimes are are, are ones that are that are that are hard ones. But you know, give us some insight into how you look at the cost challenge. Well, the costs of cancer care are going up for all cancer patients. Um, you were talking about some immunotherapies about 150 thousand a year. Um, there are many of the newer cancer drugs, whether they're immunotherapies or the newer targeted therapies, um, are approaching or even exceeding 100 150 thousand dollars a year. Um, and what that translates to in terms of out-of-pocket costs for a patient, you know, is a typical patient may have, who has insurance may still have, say, a 20% co-payment. You know, you're talking about twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 per year out-of-pocket um, in addition to what you're paying for your insurance premiums and your deductible and so on, just to pay for the cost of your drug. Um, mm. Now, you know, you could, you could ask, does... This, what does this have to do with rare cancers? It, you know, it, it, it's relevant to rare cancers to the extent that many of the particularly molecularly targeted therapies are used against tumors where the target is present in only a very small percentage of that tumor type. So, you know, if you have a patient with non-small cell lung cancer, which is one of the more common kinds of cancer overall, but now there are molecular subtypes that represent only, you know, two or three or four or five percent of the non-small cell lung cancer population. Now you've taken a common cancer and made it into a group of rare cancers. Mm. And for each of those rare cancers, there may be a unique um, molecular treatment or a combination of treatments that is, is optimal to be used, each of which then becomes extremely expensive for the small segment of the cancer patient population for whom those treatments are appropriate. And Richard, I mean, I think we have to also talk about off-label in rare, in rare cancers. I well, mean, I think the off-label, because we have a lot of patients who's in the rare cancers, we're trying the use of drugs off-label. The insurance companies oftentimes will not pay for off-label use, so it becomes sure. a battle for the patient to try to appeal those decisions. It, it's a very complicated issue in this country, maybe uniquely in, in, you know, in, in, among all the countries of the world, because, of course, off-label prescribing, that is, you know, the ability of a physician to prescribe a medication for a different use other than the FDA-approved use, is completely legal and in many times medically appropriate but not always medically appropriate. And the evidence that supports the off-label prescribing of a drug in any particular medical situation um, is, is highly variable. Sometimes there's a very strong evidence base and some of the more commonly used cancer treatments um, are, you know, are, are, are used off-label with lots of evidence behind them. But in many cases, it's a bit of a shot in the dark, uh, you know, where there's a, a promising treatment out there, maybe the patient has exhausted other standard treatment options, maybe there's some reason to believe that a new treatment might help them, the treatment could be prescribed off-label, but there's not a lot of evidence to back that up. The insurance companies, I think, are understandably oftentimes reluctant to be willing to cover those treatments because there is not necessarily strong data to support using them. The patients also are understandably um, interested in trying to receive those treatments because they represent a glimmer of hope in many cases. And so, you know, there's this tension that exists between what the medical system is willing to support, what the evidence is, you know, that backs up using those treatments, 
um, and what the payer community is willing to pay for. Now you all are in huge associations, essentially. You represent a lot of the support groups and oncologists and American Cancer Society. And in the, in the broad infrastructure, I want to raise the same question I raised with you, with, uh, with Levi Garraway, which is about literacy out there, literacy even of your own members and practitioners that are interacting with people that discover one day they're, they're diagnosed with cancer and then their world completely changes. Um, you know, not to be too critical, but, but it, it, it seems that you folks have a literacy challenge within your own ranks. Do you agree? Well, it, it, certainly with respect to genomics and the impact of genomics on establishing a cancer diagnosis or selecting a treatment, there's a lot of genomic and other kinds of molecular profiling that goes on now commonly um, for, you know, all cancer types at all stages of treatment and all lines of therapy. And I can tell you that there are very few standards. There are very few standards for how the results of those genomic tests are reported, um, the content of the lab reports, the format of the lab reports, the level of decision support that accompanies the lab reports and helps the doctor to understand what the genomic findings are. The majority of genomic findings that are reported on the profiling of any patient's tumor are of unknown significance, that meaning that we just don't know whether those genomic abnormalities mean anything with respect to either the prognosis of the patient or guidance to selecting a particular therapy. Oncologists are still very confused about this. Mm. Uh, and so a lot of what we're doing in ASCO and many other organizations are doing is trying to provide that education to our members. So are we at an era, Kim, where a patient should not trust the system, that you should be highly skeptical of the infrastructure of the healthcare industry of cancer, and that one's advocacy, because I know that you're a big champion of self-advocacy, requires one not to trust the neighborhood doctor anymore. No, I don't, I, I don't think that's the case. I don't think it's an either-or situation. Or even not the neighborhood doctor, the big uh, industry yeah, doctor. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I think that... Um, I think we have to go into this with an attitude of trust, right? We have to go into this with the idea that our doctors are trying to do the best that they can to care for us, and the rest of the, the you know, the rest of the medical folks are there. We, we we need to work towards the patient being the partner with the doctor, but the patient, I think, more and more because there is so much more information that's out there, because there is an anticipated shortage of healthcare workers in this country, right? And because there is a great disparity in the care that people will get from one site to another, we do have to more and more teach patients how to be their own best advocate, and 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 and. And that doesn't mean Dr. Google, okay? That means that we have to get them to the precise information and, and get them to the precise care. You know, what did they, they say? The right medicine to the right patient at the right time, right? So we have but to... But if you're one out of five patients that has a rare <coughs> cancer that's not going to fit within that filter, is, isn't it better to be somewhat obsessed with taking it further than well, you do, this you is. certainly do have to be your own advocate, but you also do have to tap into the system. As you said, there is a big cancer ecosystem and an infrastructure mm -hmm. that is there to help people. One of the things that I've always loved about the cancer support community is that we serve people with all cancers at all stage of their illness. M most of the groups in cancer are diagnosis specific, which does obviously provide a, you know, a level of specialty, but we have patients at the cancer support community who have myeloproliferative neoplasms. We have patients right. with fallopian cancer. We have patients with tongue cancer, you know, all of those kinds of rare cancers, and they can come to us and get the same level of care, support, information, referral um, uh, that, you know, even for someone who has breast cancer or, or lung cancer or colorectal cancer, the more, the more common cancer. So we continue to work, I think, as a cancer community to make sure that those specific and precise tools and resources are out there to help patients and guide them, but also teach them, give them the skills and the training and teach them mm -hmm. how to be their own best advocates to get the information and to build a good relationship with the healthcare team. Steve, I, I, yeah, I want to come back to this because there are a couple of points that have been made. No, number one, I have to emphasize emphasize um, that all the three of these organizations invest a tremendous amount of effort into giving, getting patient information. Mm. American Cancer Society has obviously a website and a tremendous commitment to, to accurate patient information. We have a call center available 24-7 and that right. I'm sure patients have that, that, uh, access to that. But the question you asked was about trusting the system. And it's interesting, the reason I'm smiling at some of your questions is that I, I was doing some preparation for another meeting next week. Um, and I was making some notes on the way out on the airplane, and they're exactly the same issues that you're talking about. Mm. Uh, and the reality is, how are we going to be certain that patients do get the appropriate care? 
Um, the, you, you talk to general oncologists, and I don't know if you've all had the same experience, but when you start looking at some of the guidelines, you start looking at some of the, the micro-knowledge that one needs and the rapidity with which the knowledge is changing, that our system is changing, how do we make sure that that, that, that information gets to the health professionals caring for the patient? How do we make sure that, that, that we can monitor that care? How do we make sure that patients are activated, as has been discussed, to become engaged? But we have, you know, when, when you think about it, we have all of these things going on in the world around us with data analytics, and ASCO has been very involved in that particularly in trying to move it forward in cancer care. We have all that opportunity in other industries. Mm -hmm. We have not yet effectively, in an adequate way, brought it to bear on the care of individual patients. And as our healthcare system is changing as our, in terms of payment and access, as our, um, as our knowledge increases dramatically, uh, and I won't take time to cite examples right now, but how do we make sure that that actually gets to the place that it needs to be? Not everybody is treated at an outstanding cancer center. Simply stated. And the, how do we make sure that the general medical oncologist has the information? Rich pointed out genomics. The reality is, I mean, I, I, this afternoon on my way here from the airport, I was talking to somebody who has a, an esophageal cancer, and I've got a genomics report. And he's being treated at a community hospital in, in the western state, uh, but he's also being seen in consultation by the major cancer center. And the question that I had was, well, what about this abnormality? And it was like it drew a blank because people, even at the cancer center, hadn't discussed it uh, directly. These are the, 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 the need for detail and analytics right. and, and, and bringing the power that we are developing um, to bear on this Sit, uh, on, on What's your sense this, of it? Is, is it is getting, I mean, uh, Dr. Susan Love, many of you probably know Susan Love, uh, spoke with us a few years ago, and she is, for those of you who don't know, an advocate of people who have cancer essentially giving their medical research yes. into sort of a central database yes. so that that can be used to mine that and use it for research in others, and, and, and people need to opt in, and I think it's... Uh, growing to be substantial. What I find interesting about Susan Love is she sort of wraps this in what seems to be a lot of care, a lot of caring, and you know, it comes back to Kim and talking about those support networks, because when you think about rare cancer, just the sound of it to me sounds so isolated uh, and so distant. Yeah. I mean, just the, the, the framing of that. Yeah. And I'm wondering whether, you, just to, to get to your point real quick, Len, you're a pro at this, is it getting it, it, do you have a sense that five years from now we'll be having a much different discussion because of the data that's been kicked into the system? Uh, the answer is, I hope we will. I don't think we will. You Say that again? I said, I hope we will. Uh, I don't think we will. Interesting. I mean, I, I'd, be, uh, I'd be, you know... Richard? If Rich, I, and I'm going to point again to ASCO because if they're successful, but there are barriers to making it happen. Um, there, are, there are privacy issues that people become concerned about. Uh, and CancerLink, though, I think is an excellent example of the profession mm. trying to actually take that. And there are other opportunities. This, 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 you know, I, t I even talked to that gentleman today I was mentioning. I said, who had his, his analysis, I said, have you talked to the, about the company that did it about getting into their database so that like patients can be compared? Nobody had ever talked to him about it. Mm. And, the, and yet that exists. So he's going online and he's going to to do that, that Richard. sort of activity. Well, I, I think there are these opportunities with some of the big data projects that are being built right now that really will facilitate getting more information about the so-called rare cancers. So as Len mentioned, ASCO is, has a big data project we call CancerLink. CancerLink is a, a, a intended to be a rapid learning system for oncology. It's a mm. big health IT project. We're trying to collect the complete electronic medical record from every cancer patient in America. Um, we just started a few months ago. We have over 700,000 patient records already collected, 130,000 that are ready for analysis. And I'll just give you a quick example. We asked a very simple question. Of the 130,000 cases that we're ready to analyze right now in our data set, how many of those patients have, are men with breast cancer, hmm. right? Male breast cancer right. is a rare disease, right? Um, the answer was 353. Now, I can tell you that 353 male breast cancer cases is probably the largest data set of male breast cancer assembled anywhere in the world. So if you want to learn something about male breast cancer, how it's being treated, what are the outcomes with those various treatments, there's no other 
data sets you can use to get that information. And the same will be true for other kinds of rare cancers. The, the other point I wanted to make, uh, which I, you know, I don't know how much this has been discussed throughout the course of this uh, workshop today, is how do you know if you have a rare cancer? I mean, if you're the patient, the doctor says you have cancer. How do you know, is that a rare cancer? And it's not such a simple question to answer, but I think there are some clues that you know, patients should be aware of, and one of which is if there's sort of a disconnect between the clinical presentation and the diagnosis of, can of the cancer type under the microscope. So you know, an example would be a male with breast cancer, a 20-year-old with colon cancer, um, or you can even extend it to the molecular genomics, you know, a colon cancer that's been tested for molecular abnormalities and has the HER2 gene, mm. which we typically see in breast cancer, which now we learn occurs in about 1% to 2% of colon cancers. When there's this disconnect between what you would expect clinically and what you actually observe in the patient, that's a clue that maybe you're dealing with some kind of a rare cancer. Kim? Uh, well, I, 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 I want to say um, that we're big fans of big data. We, we love the idea of big data, and we certainly think it's, it is going to lead us to, um, uh, to a lot of important answers. The only criticism that we have is in the, in the big data sets that we're gathering in healthcare, we are mainly gathering the biomedical information on the patient, and we are not collecting critical quality of life information. We're not collecting information about distress, about depression, about anxiety, about access to care, about financial toxicity, about that burden that patients face. So if, if we're truly going to get a, a, a meaningful, comprehensive, integrated data set, we continue to encourage those who are gathering this data to build in some of those quality of Is there of life a movement measures. to encapsulate all that and to systematize and provide that, or are you one hand clapping uh, for that? Well, no, I, I think there is some support for it. I think the challenge is you're dealing in some instances with much more subjective and self-reported mm -hmm. data on the quality of life side than the biomedical data, right? You can capture up the biomedical data from the electronic medical record and aggregate it. We have to find ways, uh, systematic solutions right. and systematic ways for patients to report that quality of life data. The other thing I'll say, there are obviously significant privacy concerns when it comes to the sharing of this information. But I will tell you that patients on the whole are much more willing than, than, than I'll just use a, the general term of institutions, not meaning any particular type of institution, but the institutional bodies in healthcare. Patients are much more willing to share their personal information into the system than institutions are willing to share the information with one another. And that's another barrier that we really have to break down to the, to the advantage of, of, of really moving this forward. I just come, before, come by the... Cancer Link booth at the ASCO, um, in the ASCO <laughs> exhibit hall will show you PRO Link, which is a, um, you know, a phone app that patients can use to report their own patient-reported outcomes into the Cancer Link system. We only have a, a few minutes left, but let me just go lightning around a couple of things. You know, another part of this, this uh, ecosystem right now are rip-off artists, right? So you've got Theranos, you've got Martin Shkreli, you've got how disruptive are the ripoff artists to progress in the industry, particularly when you're in an industry where on, on, on rare cancers, as you try to devote resources, is, is, do, do, do we have to have a, you know, a, a, a policy? Can you give me a, a short answer to that? Did, does Elizabeth Holmes matter to the discussion or not? Well, that's a complicated Len question. Len is blushing. <laughs> well, I'm not you know? blushing. I'm just sitting here quietly. <laughs> <laughs> Which those of you who know me I was going to say, that's, that's a, that, come on, that's event. a rare moment. <laughs> uh, I would just be cautious about naming a particular company and putting a label on them. I think that that's a, and I understand, I, I'm aware, of, I'm very aware of the situation. And, uh, well, 750% or 7,000% yeah. drug yeah. pricing. There, right. are bad, there are bad actors right. in every, bad act there okay. are bad actors in every. But you're not worried or. about it. Well, there, no, you want to talk about ripoff artists. I mean, there, you, know, I, you always are telling, and then the comments have been made during the session today yeah. by others. There's always somebody out there who's going to tell you they've got a better idea. It might be a well-meaning friend. It might be a doctor. It might be a, a, a floozy ar ar scam artist. Mm -hmm. But they've been around for decades. Right, right. right. They aren't Snake new. oil. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, cartilage. I'm not going to name now those, those particular individuals. I'm not going to name them because some of them have, uh, right. they come back at you. But, you know, the reality is those types of things have always been, and people have always had hope in that. 
People have always looked and sought that out. It's our obligation, it was commented earlier in another session, to have the trust. You know, sometimes you have to, you, have, you tell patients, you, you have to believe someone and have trust in someone. And mm -hmm. it's so important to, to have that relationship. More than, uh, you talk to patients, I'd rather have, and, and I'll, I'll yield the floor, I would rather have a caring physician by the bedside than 10 experts flying around in airplanes. I think the experts are valuable and I think they're helpful. But I as a patient, having been a patient, not a cancer patient, but as a patient, having that trust and being able to say, I know you're going to act in my best interests and particularly this time is critically let, let me go to the audience. I'm going to have to send you the Atlantic cover story from a couple of years ago of a robot and a patient. When the robot is greeting the patient, said, please have a seat. The uh, robot will see you shortly. Um, uh, that's a whole other hour of discussion, which we don't have time for today. But let me open the floor to thoughts. Walter, I told you. I pre-planted my question here. <laughs> This is Walter Granberry. Oh. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Well, I'm, I'm grateful uh, to be here and grateful for all of you. Don't thank anybody. Just go to the heart <laughs> of it. <laughs> um, as it pertains to all of the excitement around the moonshot and uh, other sorts of exciting news around the treatment of cancer more generally and rare cancers in particular, how would you respond to a critique that suggests that uh, the money that might be spent on the moonshot would be better spent on prevention, particularly prevention of environmental factors. I, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Fascinating question. I, I, don't, I, don't, yeah. I, don't think those, I don't think those things should be mutually exclusive. Right. I think we need to invest in... I you think need to we do need both the environmental factors to, and research, yeah. Richard? Oh, I mean, and, and environment, right. we're talking about environmental, we're talking about, yeah. we're talking about diet, we're talking about exercise, we're talking about behavior, we're talking about smoking, we're talking about... Right. You know, we have to invest in that equally in, in the way that we're investing in moonshot and advancing treatments and immunotherapies. Green so, Richard. couldn't agree more, and the moonshot does not exclude um, expenditure of funds on prevention. And let's keep in mind that, you know, the global burden of cancer, um, which is growing primarily in the under-resourced countries of the world, um, is still being driven primarily by um, tobacco use and infection-related cancers. And the estimates are that if we could eliminate all tobacco from the face of the earth and we could vaccinate people successfully against all infectious-related causes of cancer, we could reduce the global burden of cancer by at least 25%. Mm -hmm. And... Those, those are people who will never get cancer. Those cancers will be eliminated from the face of the earth. At colonoscopy, and they're in so, your 33%. Yep, right. right. So if I, if I can quickly, your question is absolutely on target. There are certainly uh, many out there who feel the moonshot is appropriate because we have an exciting opportunity that we've not had. But we cannot forget our investments in prevention. We cannot forget our investments in basic research. Mm -hmm. you know, every, I won't get into the Jimmy Carter issue. Immunotherapy research. The cover of Time magazine in 1973, 1973 said how immunotherapy is going to cure cancer. The cover of Science magazine in 2013 said how immunotherapy is going to cure cancer. Right. 40 years. Let's not forget that investment because what the moonshot is going to say what we have today, let's apply it, make it work. Let's not forget we need to be investing in the great new ideas today that are going to be the, 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 the next moonshot right. 15 or 20 years. Yeah. Very shortly, I want to go to Bill Nuno. I was w scanning the room, and he has the best name tag in the room. He's a f fire department. Uh, he's a fire department here in the city. So, Bill, I don't know if you have a question, but I like you. So, uh, you get a chance. You got the coolest name. Or Megan, either one. But, okay, go ahead, Megan. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Oh, you're going to hold it? Okay, my name's Megan. Actually, I am with Vilmuno here. Um, so I am an appendix cancer patient, and I have a recurrence of stage four appendix cancer, and I have questions about immunotherapy, clinical trials. Do you have to exhaust all possibilities in order to get into a clinical trial? What are the chances of someone with appendix cancer that's metastasized getting into a trial? So generally speaking, you don't have to exhaust all treatment options to get into a clinical trial. It depends on the objectives of the clinical trial and the patient population being recruited. But clinical trials should always be considered as an option at any point in the care of every cancer patient, even from the time of diagnosis. Now, appendix cancer is a rare cancer, 
And because it's a rare cancer, there are not that many clinical trials that are specifically focused on appendix cancer, but you might find some, you know, if you do a careful search. And of course, there are centers of excellence, if you will, where there are specialists who focus particularly on that disease, where they may be doing clinical trials. Uh, immunotherapy, you know, the, the only thing I can say about at least the immune checkpoint inhibitor drugs that, mm. um, you know, are, are so um, exciting these days is there are very few cancers so far where those drugs have not worked in at least a percentage of cancer patients. Um, and so, you know, I'm not endorsing the notion that every cancer patient should get an immune checkpoint inhibitor along right. the way, but certainly if you can find a clinical trial of one of those drugs in appendix cancer, it might be well worth considering. Dr. Len, real quick. Yeah, very quickly, something underlying the theme of this entire discussion all day long. We're talking about rare cancers versus breast cancer and lung cancer. In the future, where cancer is going to be, will be a, a, may be a microscopic diagnosis, but the future is going to ver rely very heavily on the, the abnormalities, the genetic abnormalities, and will be much more focused on structural, the genetic change, as opposed to what it looks like under a microscope. So understanding the structural change may, in fact, be the key to finding out what the best treatment would be. I, not getting into your personal care, but... You know, that's something that we're learning more and more. And years from now, we'll be doing the genetic analysis, maybe even before the microscopic report comes back. It may not be as relevant in the future. So rare cancers are going to be part of that whole process. Our Kim, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. When we walked out here, we were talking about rare cancers and, and, and support community, and you said many people come to you and say, where's my ribbon? Right. Uh, what can we do to get them their ribbon? Well, I, I think that I, I want folks to know certainly that no matter who you are, no matter where you live, no matter what kind of cancer you have, we have support services for you. We have counseling, we have support groups, we have educational programs, nutrition, exercise, stress reduction. There's, so, there's Cancer Support Community, our Gilda's Club here in Chicago. There's so many wonderful organizations that are providing these kinds of support services. So if you're diagnosed with a rare cancer, if you don't have your ribbon, uh, if you don't have your particular support group, I, I, I want those folks to know you're not alone. There are support services there for you that are experts there for you that are ready to help you, support you, and support your family um, through the journey. So if you're diagnosed with a rare cancer, don't feel like you're alone uh, because there are many of us who are there today right now to help you and support you. So Megan, come say hi to these folks after this session's <laughs> over. Please give a round of applause to Len, Len Lichtenfield from the American Cancer Society, <laughs> Richard Chilsky from the American Society of Clinical Oncology, and Kim, Kim Thibaldo of the Cancer Support Community. Thank you very, very much. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank, you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.